Okay, welcome to the program, October the 25th. You're with the Editor-in-Chief live with Lester's Oil. This is your multi-ingredient Omega-3 healthy aging supplement backed by thousands of satisfied customers. Six supplements in one capsule. Supports joint, heart and brain health. Take is directed. Read the label. It's about health Auckland. Duncan Garner, live. Right, good evening everybody. I'm Duncan Garner. Welcome. Good to have your company get involved. Um, leave us a message. TikTok, YouTube, all details are there. Imagine travelling around the world non-stop in a five metre yacht, 17.1 feet. You would be mad. Well, that's exactly what the authorities told the former frontman and singer for the Mockers, Andrew Fagan. Remember him? When he started planning his solo round the world adventure, the authorities said, "No, you're not. You're not going on that, mate. You're not leaving." No. He changed the flag on his boat, got around the rules, and he set off. One man, three capes to go around, and it should take a year or so. It'd be a world record. How far did he get? Let's go. Duncan Garner, live. Right, so Andrew Fagan, I regard as a bit of a legend. Uh, growing up, I remember listening to him. Mockers, you remember, you remember the band, you remember from the 80s. But he was also a talkback host and a very, very keen sailor. This is his attempt to get around the world solo on the smallest yacht ever. Astonishing. Three horns, one small boat and one madman um, sailing. Um, Andrew, g'day mate, nice to see you. Good to see you, Duncan. So you you t- you, um, you you want to go around the world. Um, you want to go around the world with the three capes never done before in terms of a small boat. Yeah. How big's your boat? 17 feet, which is like 5.18 metres. Right, so this is, this is the definition of you know, seriously mentally ill, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, come on, what are you no, thinking? No, no, lunatic fringe, that's all. <laughs> you get no fringe. Um, so um, everyone tells you you can't do it? Well, okay, there's, there's a precedent here, Duncan, all yeah. right? So in 2017, a, a Polish guy in a 20-foot boat, about 6.5 metres, whatever you call that, um, he went non-stop and he did it in 270 days from England Walk right down Atlantic, Southern Ocean, back up the Atlantic. And he and didn't stop anywhere. Didn't stop anywhere. And also a French guy did it in a 6.5 metre, well, a 21-foot boat back in 2011. Took him about the same amount of time. Right, so it can be done. You consider yourself a good sailor? Yeah, and, and I I figured because they had set the precedent that um, I could do it too, you know, and, and shave three feet off that record. Because yeah. I had sailed the boat to Australia and back in, in yeah, 94. You've done, you've done your work on it, yeah. I've been around, you know, I know how to use the boat. Yeah, you you've know. been to the Auckland Islands, you've been yeah. to, to the Deep South. And, and Auckland Islands, as in the sub-Antarctic, not... Yeah. not um, Not Wakey Island for a wine. <laughs> yeah. I've done that as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you have in record time. <laughs> so okay, so so you're really capable and um, and you love this boat. It's it's your baby in many ways, isn't it? It was, yeah, yeah. Well, it's 37 years I've had it. I bought it in 1985. Yeah, my first trip was up to the Kermadex. Uh, no, gave you no trouble. Uh, no, it was 10 days there, 13 days back, and that was before GPS. Yeah. But it was just coming out, so I used the old sextant and dead reckoning, they called it. Yeah, so you had a lot of faith in it. Yeah, always had a lot of faith in it. It, it was, you know, it's it was it's pretty unusual for 17 feet. It's not a trailer sailor. No, it's, you know, it's, it's not, is it? It's almost, it's almost it's, when I look at it, and I've never seen it, but I've looked at it in pictures, obviously, over the years. It's like an, almost like an emergency life raft in many ways. Yeah, exactly, yeah. That's, and that's I don't know it, if that's fair, but... Yeah, no, it is, and that's why it appealed to me, yeah, absolutely. Flush decked, you know, yeah. like a little tank, really. Yeah, it's buoyant, isn't it? Yeah, buoyant plywood, glassed over plywood, yep. but, you know, old, 1972. Yeah, it's unusual, because you don't see a lot of these sorts of things, do you? No, you don't. It's, it was originally based on what they called a Gary Appleby shoestring 16, which is like, you know, back in the late 60s, yeah. when everyone was building boats in their backyards, and, and people were way more enterprising than they are now. Yeah, they are. They're not now. No, they just get it for, just get it made of 3D printing on, on online. <laughs> <laughs> they might get around the world. That's right. Hey, so, um, you get um, some correspondence, just in your book, um, just reading through your book, there's some correspondence from, is it yachting Federation or That's Marine right. World or something? Yeah, New Zealand Yachting Federation. Yeah. So what goes on there is that if you want to um, go offshore internationally to another country, um, you have to get, if you're a New Zealand registered vessel, you have to get a Cat 1 certificate, Yes. which is pretty sensible. They, they come and inspect your boat and make sure you've got a life raft and make sure that all the you know the windows aren't going to punched out Aren't going to be punched out with a big breaking sea, and and they, you know, it's so it's like a warrant of fitness right. in order to go offshore. Um, and there's no way these guys will give you a warrant. No, they wouldn't. It was it was actually they the boat was fine if if I wanted to sail it to, to Fiji, for example, go north, you know, up into you know better weather. But because of my passage plan, we call it, you know, via the Great Cape, Southern yeah, Ocean, all yes. that, going down to 56 degrees south to get around Cape Horn, um, they they weren't keen on that at all. I mean, this is well, I can't blame them because this is where the, the whipbreds go. Peter Blake, this is where they, the yeah. roaring is it the roaring roaring 40s, 40s yeah. furious 50s. Yeah, all that. Yeah, that's right. Well, I, you know, I went down to the furious 50s when I went to the Auckland Islands. Yes, you know, that's that's 50. Degrees. And what is it? And when you say when you talk about those things in sailing terms, what's down the big rollers. 
it's just big. It's it's unimpeded um, swells and seas that you know that the bad weather systems, what we call the depressions, mm. you know, they they circle the globe south of New Zealand, generally speaking, and we we get a lot of that stuff here mm. in New Zealand. Mm. Um, but that's that's why you get these very very big seas, and you know, depending on the wind, you know, if it if the wind stayed ten to fifteen knots, you could do it in a kayak, you know. Yeah, but it, but, you know, but it the, doesn't, does it? You can't trust the wind. No, and, and people that go to the beach every day and you know listening to this and you know sort of you know they might have been on a boat. Once or twice, um, just to paint a picture, they've got no idea. And I don't mean, don't mean that in an arrogant way, but they they've got no idea what is down there in terms of the size of these seas. We're talking three times the size of your boat, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at worst, I, I had about ten meters um, with breaking stuff, kind of like you know West Coast piha type breaking that breakers that you see on the beach. Three story uh, building. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And you know, but not always with breaking crests. But crests. But the good thing is that you know, even if it's a very small boat. You know, when those sort of swells and waves come at you, all you do is go up a long way and down a long way. Usually, yeah. yes, they go, you go up like a like a mountain and down the other side. Now, what if there's what if there's white water at the top? What do you do then? Yeah, well, that's the bad bit. So that's what <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's actually what um, what uh, led, led led the boat astray yes. on this trip because every time I got a you know basically the breaking crests were smashing into the boat and, and filling up the cockpit you know I'm all locked up inside yes. or, or you know or even when I'm outside you make sure you close the boat up so no water can get inside yes. so you know I was getting the equivalent of like spar pools landing in the you know a spar pool load so you're sitting in the cockpit and then you'll get this breaker come along and you're sitting suddenly you're up to your waist in, in water but it all drains out you know yes. and, and that's okay and then you carry on but the boat took a lot of very heavy sideways slams because yes. Because what happens as well, the wind's never constant. It, it, um, as we see it, the same here in New Zealand, it, a, a gale, you know, if it's a, a, a Southern Ocean depression uh, traveling around the world, you'll get a northwesterly, then it backs to the west and yes. it goes southwest. And so you get leftover cross seas, and it's the leftover cross mm. seas and breakers. That's what that's what got the boat. It, so it's like a swirl, isn't it? It's all going all over the show. Yeah. Did, when, you, when you're about to take off, you know, when you, when you decide to go and do this, what crosses your mind? Why do you want to do it? What's, what's the psychology of this? Do you think you're going to die? No, I, I wouldn't have gone out there if I thought I was going to die. Um, I, it's, it's excitement, you know. I mean, it, it's it's kind of like going up 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 a level, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, from from what I've experienced before, and for me, it was also um, well, it's really what we call endurance sailing, you know, being by yourself and, and keeping that boat moving as fast as possible all the time. Um, that's the appeal to me. How like, do you sleep? Well, you know, um, so you got a wind vane. This is the boat had had a wind vane, which. Um, you know, you point it into the wind, and it and it, it's got a little gearing that attaches to a trim tab on the aft edge of the rudder. Yes. And so, if the boat goes off course, the wind vane keeps pointing at the wind direction, right? And that brings the boat back on course. So, seventy percent of the time, the boat is actually steering itself. Yes, but in your how many? What's the longest sleep you get? Well, it, if you know, you could be, you could. I mean, really, about four hours is, is my maximum. But you know, like little two-hour blocks and things. But having said that, you know, that means you get up and have a look around, make sure the boat's going as fast as possible as, as it can. What about the container ship coming just from the right? Have you seen that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the big whale that's just yeah, hit you. Yeah. I mean, like yeah. Well, okay, so when I'm in close to the coast, you know, I'm always I've got a little egg timer alarm that I set for like half an hour, twenty minutes, and I'm always popping up and looking. <sighs> yeah, so that's bad, right? But it's when terrible you, sleep. Yeah, it is a terrible <laughs> sleep. But when you get offshore and you get away. You know, the chances out there in the Southern yeah. Ocean of being run over are very slim, you know. I mean, in, in ideal situations, you should always be keeping a watch, but you can't, you know. No. And so I had there's an element of sailing faith that comes into it, faith that you're not going to be run over or you're not going to hit something. Well, faith that you know what's out there as well, you know, to a point, to a, to a point, yeah, you know, you've been point, there before, yeah. you've travelled. Yeah, and I also have a, a thing called um, AIS, Automatic Identification System. So all these big ships, they all run that, they all have to. So I can turn on my little machine yes. and it will show me who's around yeah. you know, within within say 25 miles yeah and I'd, I'd turn that on before I was going to go to sleep and right so there's an alarm system as well yeah sort of yeah yeah so no one's going to really knock on your front door you don't get too many surprise visitors <laughs> hopefully not but the other big <laughs> one the other big one is you don't want to you know run into anything and again that's an act of faith as well you know I mean there are a lot of containers that come off ships these yeah, days yeah not so much in the southern ocean but like you know all sorts of places do you see things out there what do you do you see containers bobbing around I've never seen any no no but they say to watch out for them but we've never seen them yeah but whales yeah, seen whales in the past, but not on this trip I didn't. So I was out there like 40 days and 40 nights basically before it all went wrong. Mm. And 
I didn't, you know, a lot of um, a lot of albatrosses. Because I, so the latitude I was in is I got down to about forty between forty and forty five degrees south, which is kind of like Christchurch, Timaru. Yep. You know, it's not that far south. Um, and I stayed there while I went east for two and a half thousand miles. So I got I got halfway to, to South America, halfway to Cape Horn before the boat sort of came undone. Right. And so it described that process of it. Um of it coming undone? Well, essentially, what you've got underneath a yacht, you've got a keel, which keeps it upright, and even if the boat gets smashed down onto its side, or even upside down, the boat will come back upright because of the, the weight in the keel. Yep. And it's not like a trailer sailor or, a, you, no. know, you know... It's you, it's, free, it's free heavy and sturdy. Yeah, that's mm. it. And mm. then, you've got, then you've got your rudder, but also on, on my boat, you had what, is a, a, what we call a skeg, yep. which... Um, which is just in front of the rudder and attached to the boat with three, you know, silica bond, bronze bolts and all the glue and all, you know, fiberglass and all that yeah. stuff. And that, that gives the boat directional stability so the wind vane will work. So basically... Um, it's extra strength, isn't it? Just another bit more strength? It, it's strength, but it's, it's more direct. It gives it that directional so it doesn't sort of skitter around too yes. much, you know. So what went wrong there was that the skeg... Because um, we were getting so many s- s- big sideways slams from these breaking seas, you know, uh, we had a lot of big big lows coming through, um, you know, de- weather depressions, they call them. Yes. Um, 975, 965, that's how low they are in terms of the barometer reading yes. and things, which are, which are deep, you know, they're deep lows. And big seas, because we were getting smashed around so much, and because I had so much gear in the boat, which made the boat heavier yes. than it had yes. before. Yes, all food and everything. Yeah, yeah. So every time it was getting hit, basically at some stage, I wasn't sure when, but about three weeks weeks before it all went wrong um, the glue line of the skeg got cracked mm. and then the, then it worked and, and I could sort of and then it started sort of seeping in seawater about I was taking about 10 litres a day to start with and that was a bit unusual trying to work out where it was coming from I thought it was just coming from the cockpit being filled with the breaking seas and you and, thought you could carry on with this with yeah. this yep no, that was all. I mean, that was anticipated. Yeah. Well, like, you know, the rough stuff. I, you know, and and I was inside. I was fine. I was just reading my Kindle and but getting smashed around. But you know, you know, eating, you know, cooking up my freeze, boiling my water on my little primer stove. It's gimbaled, you know. Yeah. But but the motion was pretty severe. Yeah. So this this skeg just kept on working, and eventually, um, the three bolts sheared off completely, and the skeg just went, just disappeared. Uh, I, I only worked that out in the middle of the night because the wind vane self steering stopped. Working. Stopped. Yeah, that's a giveaway, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That, that was it. And then I was then. Then it was like, uh-oh, and then I, I realised what had happened, and then I realised why the water was coming in the boat. Yes. So at that stage, I was the nearest land was a 1,000 miles north, which was Pitcairn Island. Yep. Um, and so I decided to sail there. Um, so what happened then was without the ski and, and without the self-steering working, it meant I, the only way I was going to get anywhere was by sitting hand steering. You had to sit there all, all day, the time. all night, yeah, yep. that's and guts it out for how long a week, probably? Well, no, it would have taken 25 days, probably, to get us all you could do from doing I was doing like 90 to 100 miles a day which was great that's good with, with this wind vane self-steering but once I once I started hand steering you have to sleep obviously mm. so that that was going to look like more like 50 miles a day best at best and how do you sleep when you how would you have slept uh, and having to control it as well what? well well I wouldn't so what happens is it's called you sort of we call it hove to mm. so you, you sail and then you just sort of turn in a circle with all the sail set and the boat just stops and you push it and you tie the tiller down to leave and the boat just takes up a side-on position to Ooh. the sea. It's okay, and then it just goes up and down, and kind of like, and that's it. And you and you sleep like that. You but know? how far do you drift? Well, you would. That's right. It's not good. You 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 might lose um, like five. I don't know. It depends. It could be two steps forward, one back, right? Yeah, absolutely. Or yeah. five sideways. Sort of, yeah, but not that far. <laughs> so, in the first time when I decided to sail to Pitcairn, I was doing, I did um, in eleven and a half hours, I did forty-five miles, which was great. It was, right, just, yeah. it was just starting to get dark, and I thought, okay, this is good. I'm, you know, but because the wind was was side on and and, and favourable, I I, I, it I out. thought, yeah, I thought, yeah. right, I went inside, and then I thought, right, I'm now going to keep going. Gas it out, yeah. And then um, when I came outside, and then. Um, you know, I was going along okay, and then the rudder snapped off, yeah. and then I was completely stuffed. Yeah, once the rudder snapped off, and that's because it must have got stressed as well, and and from the flexing and from the skeg. You've had any issues with your rudder before? Never, never had any issues. Shows with how the tough it is out there, right? Yeah, 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 never had any trouble with the skeg before. I mean, when I was down at the Auckland Islands in 2007 on the boat, I was in 65 knots and in a tide race, you know, with massive um, white water, yeah. just picking the boat up and spinning it round. What you would know? you have done if you got to Pitkin? Yeah. 
Would you have been able to fix it all up and go again? Yeah, because because yeah. so I had a little satellite text machine, right? So yeah. I was talking to Pitcairn Island, yeah. and I'd previously worked um, on a freighter that went to yep. Pitcairn Island from Tauranga for three years. So I'd got to know the people there, and I'd already asked them, and they, I knew they had a little crane mm. that they used for taking these small containers and you know for all their food and stuff. So I, I knew they could lift the boat out the water, and and they said they would. Yeah. So, so, yeah. I was so you knew them. You're optimistic, and they, yeah, they, optimistic they didn't have a rescue craft, though, did they? No, no, but they couldn't. Come um, th- that far. They've got these really big, uh, what they're called like lighters, big long boats. Yes. Um, but they wouldn't. They now they wouldn't because they wouldn't come down that far. No. So, so I still, had to get there. Yeah. You're still a thousand k away. Yeah. Right? But but my, my plan was I'll get there. I'll get the boat out the water. Spend a few months. Build a new skeg, and then carry on. You know, and off we go. But once the rudder broke, then I was in, totally incapacitated and I wasn't going anywhere. Well, you're drifting at this point, aren't you? Yeah, just drifting. I, I spent a few days trying to make a, what we call a jury rudder, you know, but it, it wasn't successful, you know. Not in that in those conditions. No. Okay, so well, there's no there's no jetty, there's no ferry service. No. You're stranded at sea. Were you shitting yourself? Um, no, I, I wasn't actually because if if the boat had sunk under me, right, so, so say when the skeg came off, the, the three bolts had completely popped out, yeah. then the boat would have been sinking and I would have had to get in a life raft. What you've got? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I had a life raft, brand new, you know. So, you know, I would have just had to abandon the ship and it would have, the boat, and it would have sunk, you know. And then I would have been um, feeling pretty pretty anxious. But because I was still in the boat and I had 14 months worth of food and water, you know, I was just going yeah, up You had comms as well, right? Yeah, comms, yeah. This was the satellite. So you got a satellite and, phone, you yeah. got you got a life raft. You, you, yeah. um, you're all pretty... You, you're, you're still a few steps before you get eaten by a shark. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so feeling pretty, you know, like it was perverse because I was actually okay, mm. but I wasn't going anywhere. And then the trouble was that Pitcairn had, have got police on there and they were talking to New Zealand police who were talking to Search and Rescue in Wellington. And then the, as far as Search and Rescue in Wellington were concerned, it was a red flag. They don't want someone out there just drifting around. You know? no. But in the old days... But they knew you were out there too, didn't they? Yeah, they did. That's a, that was a trouble. In the old days, before this massive communication that we've got via yeah. satellite, no one would have known what was going on. No. And I just would have drifted probably for three months which and, and hit... Um, South America yeah. eventually while bailing out. And you would look like sort of, you know, this, the, the big bearded guy <laughs> walks up to Easter Island or walks up through Peru and is like, I'm here. It's like, who are you? That's right, yeah. exactly. We, we yeah. had a funeral for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> they yeah. do, and they do. Yeah, well, that's the sort of thing. So um, once they knew of my plight, then I, the pressure came on to, to get rescued, inverted commas, you know. And, and I didn't really want to, well, you know, I didn't want to put shipping out. You know, I didn't yeah. want people to have to divert. Were well, you things. pissed off at having to be rescued? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean that was that. Yeah, it was so it was more annoyance than fear. You know, it was more frustration than fear, yeah. really. And also the, those pricks that told you not to go. Oh, well, they told you so. You know, well, that, they, it's just those little things getting here, don't they? Yeah, yeah. If you if you let them, yeah. yeah if you let them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you're at um, you're trying to communicate with with, with who? With well, so I was communicating by then directly with search and rescue, and you know, I. I said to them, well, you know, because I didn't want, a, you know, some big ship to have to divert hundreds of miles to yeah. come and pick me up. I said, well, is it possible, you know, can I pick and choose which ship I get on, you know? <laughs> yeah, like I, I thought I could wait until someone was coming past, you know, maybe wait wait a week or something or a couple of weeks. And if there happened to be a ship, and, they, they, you know, there, weren't, there were about four. There's not many down there, you know, but there were big four that were going to news well, some were going to South America, China. There's a couple. Well, you want to get taken to the right port as well, did you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Well, see, COVID was still happening, yeah, you know. Yeah. So I didn't want to end up in South America, you know, um, and trying to make my own way back. It was going to be expensive. All that you could co- be there for years. Exactly. Especially What's with, the bad bit? Especially with COVID. <laughs> you know, so, um, so I... Um, so, Honey, I'm in Colombia. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. So um, so I said, you know, well, can I pick and choose? And they said, absolutely not. That's not the way search and, search and rescue works. You know, you just have to... Yes. So I had to turn on my um, my EPIRB, the yep. emergency position indicating radio beacon, which are great things, Send Ends up a satellite signal which says, "Hey, you know, I'm in trouble." It's a but they knew they, you know, I said, "Look, I'm not in trouble, you know, not immediate trouble, but I'm stuck, you know." Yeah. And so when I turn that on, then they send out a mayday to every sh- all the shipping nearby, which is only about four ships, but they are all within 500 miles. And then they, um, and then they, t- and then they wait for a response, and no one responded <laughs> <laughs> for about for about 10 hours. And I think that's because if you, you can, do like- you have to respond? Um, no, um, unless they task a specific vessel, which is what they right. did after that. They so, can order them to do something. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, via the shipping officers. But basically, it was if you you can liken it to 
me, you know, like they're big trucks on a motorway. Mm. They're just doing it. And I was like a motorbike that's broken down. Yeah. And they really didn't want to know about it. No, I, I they're shaking along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just a hassle for them. But in the end, um, and, and my, my plan A was I was thinking, well, maybe there's going to be some big warship doing drills. And they'll come along and guys will be abseiling down. They'll just, they'll just pick up, they'll crane my boat out oh, the you're water. you're getting delirious now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that was plan A. And what then, was out there? Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then plan B. Sorry. <laughs> You distracted me now, and then and then Plan B was okay. I've got like thirty k's worth of stuff on board, all my electronics. So I put them all in bags. Yeah. And I thought that they'll just put a boat in the water, come over, you know, ten minutes, throw all my good stuff, all my you know fourteen months freeze dried. It was worth about you know a lot of money, it's thousands of bucks. Yeah, throw yeah. throw all that in and jump on, and unfortunately wave goodbye to the boat. You know, that's Plan B, and Plan C was the worst case scenario, which unfortunately happened, where they a ship came and they just picked up me. You know. And okay, so you got the, they they ended up instructing a ship. Yeah, they yeah. tasked big one. It was about as big as you can get a three hundred meter container ship that was going to Tauranga, which was good. Um, but I mean, it's so big it can't even get into Auckland, or um, or it only goes into Napier. And God, Tauranga. I must have dwarfed you when it turned up. Oh, it was just horrendous, scary. I was getting dark, and this it was like an apartment block. Yeah, that just and it's like three stories high before you get to the deck, and then it's got eight stories high with containers, and you know, totally loaded up. And this thing turned up on the horizon. <laughs> And it was like, oh, here we go. Like suddenly, you know, it was jeopardy. You know, what had been just, okay, I'm out there, you know, self-contained and doing what I want to do. And, and it felt like it was going quite well until it all, you know, until, until it had, didn't, yeah. yeah, until the rudder came off, essentially. And these guys turn up and they, they, and they couldn't see me yeah. until they got within two miles because I was so small. It's still quite rough, still got three, four metres running and getting dark. And, and they just couldn't, and they couldn't pick me up on radar because I was, the, the boat was going yeah. down. In, so the in, in and out of valleys and mountains. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so they got within, t- and I was just talking to them on the handheld VHF, and and it was English as a second language, which was quite difficult as well, you know. And they turned up, and they just got close. I thought they were kind of run me over. They got so close, and then they just stopped about a hundred meters away, downwind. That's from so me. close, isn't and it? They were just mass, and there were all the the crew were up there like taking selfies, and they were waving like it was just all normal, you Hi. know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the trouble was that you know they said to me, "Can you row to us?" And I said, "Well, no, I hadn't got any oars. I did have oars, but I'd I'd already I'd wasted one oar trying to make a journey." Right. Yeah. 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 Um, and I said, can you put a boat in the water? And they said, no, no, too dangerous, you know. And it was, I mean, all they had, they didn't have a rib. Yeah, they like rescue crafts. Yeah. Well, yeah, they just had those lifeboats. And once yep. they, they're discharged, once you put them in the water, they can't get them back. Interesting though. It's interesting, though. I mean, if they should, you know, there's, there's a diversion, it should carry a rib. Yeah, that would have been good. I mean, some ships do, you yeah. know, but these these guys didn't. And so they, they just sat there, and it, then it was like, okay, so now it's just up to me. <laughs> well, they're all watching. It's just up to How me. How do you get up onto a ship that, well, that big? Well, that was it. And they they didn't really say, and and because the communication wasn't very good, you right. know, and they and so you know, they wanted me to get come alongside, but the trouble was, because of the wind that was blowing and their windage, because they were so big, um, they were drifting about the same speed as me, and so I so there was like nothing was happening there, like so I had to um, pull up my sails and try to sail to them but without a rudder all I was doing was sailing in little circles and yeah. they must have thought I was such Doing a donuts. such a rubbish sailor yeah yeah. yeah. and in the end like, and their English, English was second language yeah? Yeah, yeah yeah it wasn't good and you communicating on the on the phone talking on the, on the, the VHF yeah, 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 all the time VHF yeah, yeah. yeah and so he was trying to hold he had a big bow thruster really not you know he was trying to hold position while I tried to sail I was sailing in little circles and in the end I, it got dark and then I ended up going right around the boat twice while he was kind of trying to hold position it's nightmare isn't it yeah and I almost got squished under the counter which is the back of the yeah. boat where the rudder is you know because like that was going up and down about 10 metres and, and and I got really and the close props, the pro- are the props going at this stage yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and like oh um, my god so that was that was probably the, that was the hairiest bit yeah I was right in underneath the stern but then he you know he was pretty skillful he managed to keep turning and get away from you were me getting, you were getting sucked in were you not really we, but I was right there right oh. there literally right under there I thought the mast I thought if we got under there the mast would have just come down yeah. and it's all messy. It's you know, all over. Isn't it? Messy. Yeah. So I just, in the end, I managed to get close enough, and they threw this what we call a heaving line down to me, and then halfway down the ship, about 150 meters, was a bright light, you know, with little heads sticking out of it, <laughs> and that was the that was like the, what they call the pilot boarding yeah. station. Yeah, they're going to hold there. Yeah. So they put a they they dangled. They had a like a, I could see they had a um, a rope ladder dangling down, you know. So we basically together, the crew were up there all screaming, um, you know, in their own language, and at each other, you know, and I 
we sort of I pulled the boat stern first down the side of the ship, but you know it was a massive steel wall, and we, and my boat was like a little tennis ball being oh, thrown yeah. against it. We were getting, taking massive hits, you know, just being lifted up on a swell and just smashed. Prizes were still in one piece. Well, I kept on looking inside, um, thinking, you know, what looking for the water coming up. I thought it was going to split the side of the yeah, boat, yeah. And, I, and then I was a goner, you know, if that was the case, because they weren't going to come come out. You would have been in the water, absolutely. Yeah. So we managed to get down to the boarding ladder, and then it turned out well the boarding ladder was too high, oh. you know. And so another twenty minutes goes by while I'm just getting. Smashed. smashed against this so and you know one moment the boarding ladder's there the next moment we've surged way yeah, over you know yeah. and 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 they're all sort of screaming you know it's showbiz because they had the bright lights on me and stuff it's a movie <laughs> isn't it <laughs> not just a book <laughs> but then i had to get on the boat you know and so then it was like i had all my bags with my 30k's worth of gear and i had a heaving line but i couldn't make them understand that i wanted to get the, the you know the the bags up first before me you're trying to save and salvage your stuff yeah so in the end, I just had to make a jump for the ladder, and I leaped onto the onto the ladder. But I took the rope with me, and it was it was about only about seven meters I had to climb up. But that's like you know it seemed like a long time at the time. And also their ship was rolling towards me, so uh. the, the ladder was coming out and then coming back in. Oh, so you were going out, yeah, yeah. and then banging yeah. banging against the, the yeah. wall, yeah, smacking against the cum, holy smack. shit, yeah, exactly. <laughs> was it hard hanging on? Yeah, you're real bad. Um, I, I didn't realize I was so weak because it'd been like this was forty five days, yeah, and. That I've been out there, and I didn't realise that you know I was so tired. But you don't realise how strong you are too, and you will to live. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's that's what I was counting on. But when I actually held on to this rope ladder, I realised that every, it was just a classic cliffhanger. Every you know handhold had to be exactly right because these guys are watching. But if I'd fallen off um, into the water, they just would have had a selfie of me drifting down the side of the boat, and that was it. You know. So so I managed to get onto the rope ladder and climb up, and then as I was getting higher, the the mast of my boat was smashing against. The, oh, so you're next to it. Yeah. Yeah, so that could have picked me off the rope ladder as well. And I got about halfway up, and then I looked down and I saw that in this rope that I was holding with my 30k's worth of gear and the bags started, started like trying to pull me off. And, uh, looked down and it was all tangled in the cockpit. Get rid of it. So I let go of 40, 30k just like that. Yeah. And then I just kept climbing and, and I got there. Yeah. And then they that already let the boat go. And, um, and then it was just so just bizarre. I was in this massive, you know, neon, neon lit steel corridor. And felt like a, a prisoner, really, because suddenly you've lost all your autonomy, and yeah. you are the you are the shipwrecks. Sort of this victim. is this is this is you've seen this number of times through the interview, which is you know about, about freedom and autonomy, and you know because when you're at sea on your own as a well, solo sailor, there's a reason why very few do it because most people like like people. You like, <laughs> you, you, but well, you, see, you do too. But you like that solitary yeah. battle against the world, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. like uh, you know, I wanted to be out there for a year. That yeah. was the plan, you know, and and because I've done it before. Like when I went when I sailed to Australia. Yeah, there's something so only certain individuals can do this, though. You know? well, well, that took 17 days for Australia, 18 days back, you know. And when I was down the Auckland Islands, you know, I went non stop from there up the west coast back to Auckland. That was another 17 days. So I know that once you get beyond about five days by yourself because of the broken sleep, yeah. you just. Um, Time means nothing. No, it I completely agree. changes. Yeah. Because it's, you're just, it could be seven days, it could be 27 days. It's all about the wind and nature and everything. Yeah, isn't it? yeah. And yeah. there's no sort of, there's no context like yeah. we have here. You know, there's we, no traffic going too toot in the morning and nothing. There's no context <laughs> whatsoever. Dinner. All you're doing is keeping that boat moving. You know, it's a real lesson, isn't it? Because um, it's a lesson in us as individuals what we what we have to battle every day. We have such cruisy lives, really. I know we work, everyone works and goes, around, but we have cars and we have devices and everything's done for us. It's not yeah. This, it's this just, survival. This thing is survival. This yeah, is yeah. a meat stage. Yeah. That's part of the challenge, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it, it is. And it's you sort of you know you're always. It's, it's apprehension. There's always in the back of your mind the awareness that you are vulnerable, you know. It's but it also gives you a certain edge of excitement about the whole oh, thing. Every day is every second. Yeah, even when it's flat calm. But you know, but you can, you know, like I say, if it's flat calm, you might. But it's never flat calm out there. Uh, it's always always a big groundswell. And, and I think that's what I like about being on boats and fishing. And that the, the, the time goes so quickly because you are so busy. There's there's more than one thing to do at any one time. So you are you almost need five hands. Five feet, five brains, because that's that's from my perspective. That's how I've always seen boating. You know. Yeah, well, yeah. You, there's always something to do. You know, even uh, even on this boat. I mean, if the wind, you know, to keep that boat sailing as fast as possible, which in my case is, is only like five knots. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I, I, when I went to Australia, I averaged two point nine knots. Right. But that's but yeah, but that's only because of the days when you're becalmed. Yes. Because you're sailing and you, and you and you don't motor. You, you, you just stop. <laughs> on the ship, so you're on the ship, and many people would just be absolutely relieved and elated that they were picked up by this big um, steel tanker and they're going to not even feel the bumps on the way through. You have a mix of 
Thanks for being here, but I don't. I don't want to be here. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah, you seem disappointed. Yeah, well, they put me. Yeah, it was, you know, and they put me in the hospital ward, and and because the, they 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 were sort of treating me. They were really nice, wonderful, wonderful to me. But they were treating me like I'd, you know, because I looked pretty rough from a big grey beard and stuff. And they and they treated me like I'd been in a life raft and without any food and water for 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 weeks, you mm. know, because because. Because for them, you know, people who work on those big container ships, it's really just factory workers. Yeah, you know? and it's the like going to work at an other factory. Yeah. Like, yeah, and when and when you're up on them, you know, when you, and you look at the sea, the sea means nothing. It's so far down. Yes, and you know, you, you, there's a slow lethargic roll, but it's nothing like what you know when you're in a little. No, boat. you did right. Yeah, this is it's almost it's almost like you're just going to going to work in Penrose. It is, but it is for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but they were. Those guys were trapped on there for nine months. You know, they, that's how long their swings were. You know, shifts that yeah. they were on board, which yeah. was pretty, pretty full on. But when I got onto the boat, because I hadn't been able to take my ship's papers and all the normal yeah. things that you'd have, like the because you know when you leave from New Zealand and you've got your customs clearance, they want to see all that stuff. You know, yeah, you, you had no car, uh, you had no nothing. Car all, I, all I had was a couple of GoPros, a couple of VHFs, and my passport. Your passport's crucial. Yeah, that was it. I had that, but I didn't have the ship's papers, and so. And also, at the time when they picked me up, they were rolling a lot and they'd lost all their internet, so they didn't know who I was. And I told the crew, because it was English as a second language, I didn't say, oh, look, I'm trying to sail around and set, set the record for the smallest Pablo boat. Pablo you know, I, I, <laughs> I said, I'm trying to go to South America. Yeah. And so they immediately, you know, they thought, okay, the, you know, the captain came down and he sat there and looked at me, and I could just see, he said, why haven't you got your ship's papers? And and he just thought I was a drug smoker. Like, yeah. Know? And if they'd looked at the bales of freeze-dried food that I had all... Well, all, all, all Taped up, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it would have looked, it would have looked like a chunk of cocaine or something. Oh, right? Absolutely, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <A> shame. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I mean, they, but they work out pretty quickly that okay, this yeah, is how they, it is. Yeah, they, that was cool. And then they, then they were nice to me, and and they took me out of the hospital. Well, to start with, they had a sort of guard on me, you know, like there was no just a guy always sitting with me to make just sure. In I, case you weren't well, part they, of a pirate group or something. Yeah, they wouldn't let me out of the room. Even when we, later on, when they put me upstairs in a normal cabin, um, I wasn't allowed to go anywhere without. Um, contacting them, you know, because they just—I don't know—it was just the way they they were handling. Yeah, them. well, it's a foreign boat to you, and what yeah. if you when you got your pistol that you've been hiding and whatever in my boot, in my gum boot. Yeah, well, who knows? But because those guys, yeah. are, they have to be aware. I suppose. Yeah, they were. Now they're, they're taking it pretty seriously, and also, you know, I was their patient. That was the way they looked at it, and the guy yeah. was doing my blood pressure every day. They took day. it seriously, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. They were trying to, you know, they're making sure I stayed alive. Yeah. So then that was seven days. At, they were travelling at twenty knots. Yeah. Seven days um, into Tauranga, and then you know got there, and and that was it. And you hopped off yeah. by walking the plank, and then yeah, you... with nothing, yeah, except what I was wearing, basically. You still had the same clothes on. Um, oh, they gave me a jersey. Right, but I had yeah. I washed. I got. They did wash my clothes for me. So okay. So okay. So you had your clothes and a passport and a wallet or whatever. That, yeah, my, my passport and my GoPros and my VHF, and that was it. And had you, and you did what? Uh, drive back to a uh, hitchhike back to Auckland or something. Yeah, no, yeah. I got I got picked up and um. So and, got you. Yeah, yeah, but actually at the time it was still COVID and. They were letting people fly in, but they were, you know, the, the system was so oh, it was terrible. so bad with, yeah. with shipping, you know. And because I was getting off the ship with, and no, you know, these guys weren't had been on there, not, you know, it was eight the months. Worst time to be getting off the ship. Yeah. But these guys had been on there, and they didn't have COVID, you know. There was no COVID on board. No, because they were sea. Yeah. yeah, but the, the the system was trying to, you know, make me make me pay like two grand to get picked up in a Toyota Hilux van all by myself and and drive me back to Auckland for quarantine for for two weeks. You know, tell them you spent forty five days at the sea going go to hell. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sort of. Yeah, but, but they, let, they let someone come and get you. Yeah, we managed to circumvent that eventually. Do you want to go back out there again? Absolutely. Yep. I, I'd be there now, Duncan, if yeah, I could. No, no, no. It's, it's just the um, yeah, just the finance, man. It's, it's expensive. Google. What does it cost to? Have you replaced the boat? You get insurance? No, this was the other trouble. Where um, is it then? Where's the boat? Well, okay. So when I left the boat, this is why the book's called Swirly yeah. Lost at Sea. Um, it was it was taking in say. 10, 15, 20 litres of water a day. So I wasn't there to bail it out, you know. It's filling up, yeah. You know, filling up and also, um, you know, my, my weather guy, weatherman, uh, Bob McDavid, he worked out the currents and he reckoned if it stayed afloat, it would have taken about three months to get to South America and get smashed up at pa- the Patagonia. Yeah. yeah. But it was 4,000 metres deep out there. And, and I think the only positive buoyancy inside the boat normally a keeler with a keel yeah. if it fill it up it'll just sink you know but because it had all that freeze dried food in it all bail, bales that might have kept it floating like a waterlogged log yeah just sort of submerged just below yeah just like that and you know and growing weeds all over all that you know but I think in all reality it probably sank I, I, I made up a sign with yeah. my 
email address and phone number on. Why not? Yeah. And saying, if found, please. Uh, but and you've had no, no nothing. It's, it's, it just shows how vast it is out there. Just yeah. how vast is the ocean? You know, we, I, I've been at sea, but not out at sea. It's and just how vast? Massive, eh? it just, you don't see land even today. No, no, it's just absolutely massive. Eh? Like once I'd cleared East Cape, New Zealand, on the way out, that was it. You know, like, for, and that was, you know, that was going to be like that. It was going. I thought it was going to take about eighty to ninety days to get to um, South so America. So you had forty days in one direction. Yeah, and you saw nothing. Nothing. No, I saw one ship just just off East Cape. Um, when, when I was the car, absolutely nothing. I mean, yeah. that would drive people. That would drive some people. Albatrosses, birds. Yeah, they're lovely. They, yep. were, they were like checking me out. They, they actually look at you. It's quite. Oh, no, they, 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 they massive come, wingspan. Yeah, and they come right in close, and they know you can't get them because it's that's their domain. But they actually come right in and eyeball you. What are they looking at? Well, I think, I think what's this freak? Why you, what's this freak doing here? Mate, there's no one out here. They want to say. Yeah, yeah. But there, isn't it freaky though? 40, 40 odd days in one direction, and you don't see anything. Nah, nothing. No, no. You must wonder. Is, does this Earth end anywhere? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, is there a cape somewhere? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a bit like that because it's just all you've got is an endless horizon, and there's nothing to define where you are. Exactly. A- apart from the technology, you know, say, oh yes, I've done sixty miles a day, you know. But physically looking at it, you know, what changes is the, uh, is the, uh, the sky, the seascape, and of course at night the the stars when it's clear. But most of the time there was always cloud cover, you know. God, it just shows how, and and it just shows how much of our planet. Is water absolutely amazing? Has much of it changed over the years you've been out there? You know, say twenty years ago, fifteen years ago. Have you, do, 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 do you see this climate change in action or anything? Do you see anything? No, 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 no. I mean, out there, it's so deep and it's so vast. Yeah. I mean, and it's not really. So you're not. You know, there might be microplastics in the water, but unless I was sampling it, testing it, you never know. You know. Yeah, but how much water's on the on, on the planet? It's like eighty percent. We're we're eighty percent water. I think so. It's phenomenal, isn't it? Though? Absolutely, yeah. And it's and it's violent. You know, it can be the thing. I think the thing with the climate change is is definitely because the water's heating up in certain yeah, places. Yeah, you notice and that. Eh? So we've all got. This is why all these, you know, the gales are tending to be worse. You know, like look at that um, hurricane Mildred. Yeah, that, yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, imagine 175 knots of wind. That's oh, just, just you're gone. Just yeah, yeah, just horrendous. We lift you up. Yeah, I mean, at the worst I had on that trip was I had like 50, 60 knots, you know. But if you double that, it'd just be phenomenal. What it does to the, the sea, wind tunnel, yeah, yeah, and what it does to the sea surface is 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 what is the trouble. That's right, and so and we're seeing. I think we're seeing some of these more these more violent storms. Probably for the first time, you know, it gets increasingly. I mean, the climate it's always climate's always changed. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, for but sure. It does seem to have, it does seem to be. I don't want to get into a big debate about this, but it does seem to be on, on the edges. You know, quite violent on the edges. You know. Yeah. Well, the the systems seem to be more yeah. intense. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, Fagan, brilliant, mate. It's 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 a um it's not to have chat to you about it, and you know, I love the sea and just hearing it, it's just immense. Well, thanks. Thanks. Do you think you'll go again? Yeah, absolutely. But but it's it's going to take me a while to put it. What together. do you need? How much do you need? Oh, it's well. I, I'm gonna need a boat first. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but all the gear, you know, you're probably talking about thirty k's worth of gear. Minimum, man. Yeah, yeah, you know, really. So it's you just got. I just got to chip away at it. You know? Two rudders. Yeah, yeah. Well, I had a, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Some boats oh, do I, have two rudders. I think you're courageous and brave, and I've always, um, always had a lot of respect for you and what you do and everything. So brilliant stuff. Thanks for talking to us. Thanks for having me and Duncan. You're very welcome. Duncan Garner live. Okay, Andrew Fagan. What, what a story! What a great story. Um, Isaac, I'm sorry, but um, 17.1 feet boat. So that's sort of little. That's a runabout. Size of a runabout in, in Auckland Harbour. Hmm. That's astonishing, isn't it? That's crazy. It's wild. You'd think you're going to die. He said he didn't think that. But oh man, yeah. And like, what about the container ship? Boarding the container ship. Yeah, that's a, that's that's crazy <laughs> to me. The idea of just like sitting in the water below that. It's and and, and holding onto that rope and smacking into it. Yeah, his... yeah, terrifying, eh? A tough guy, eh? Oh, yeah, 100%. And he wants to go and do it again. I mean, honestly, good. Like, he obviously seems like he could have done it. It was just, you know, technical difficulties. Yeah, Stopped well, him. The radar, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Broke. But it must take a mountain to sink that boat, eh? Oh, yes. You know? Yeah, 100%. Good, I mean, yeah. Hey, can you imagine being on the water not seeing anyone or hearing anything, seeing anything for 45 days? That's, I know. He's all one ship. That's wild, eh? Like, yeah. That's, and to get, that's isolation it, at its finest. But also it shows how much water is in the world. Yes, yeah, like, you know, yep, it's powerful, mate. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, crazy. Um, thank you, Isaac, for showing interest in this. Um, yes, <laughs> that's, that's us. That's us. It's Friday. We're out of here. Um, thank you for tuning in to Duncan Garner, editor in chief, um, live with Esther's Oil, the premium New Zealand-made um, fish oil supplement, backed by a very, very, very good study. Support joint, heart, and brain health. About health. Have a five hundred dollar Pro Health Pack giveaway running in October, with all the orders going into the draw to win. Now, you can use the code Duncan for ten percent off, and you get an extra entry as well. About health. Take us directed. Read the label about.
about Health Auckland. Duncan Garner, live. And have I told you it's 0800 399 You can um, use that number and get hold of them straight away. That's us. Long Weekend's here. This will be available as a podcast right through the Long Weekend. And don't forget to um, jump online and have a look. Um, wherever you get your podcasts, jump on there. It might be Rover, it might be wherever. We have done hundreds of podcasts. We have something for everyone, so jump on in there and, and have a look. Have a bit of a, a bit, a bit of a look around the website and um, see if you're interested. Thank you for all your feedback and your support. I'm Duncan at Rover.nz. To my team, Isaac and our consultant, Forrester, <laughs> yeah, Lockie. Thank you, guys. We'll do it again on Tuesday. And remember, life's no dress rehearsal. Get out there and enjoy the long weekend. There's no curtain raiser. This is the life that we live, and we're living in it right now. So get out there and enjoy it. Have a great day. There's no second chance. This is it, okay? Get out and enjoy it. Take care. Ta-da. That was Duncan Garner, Editor-in-Chief Live. Miss something on the live stream? Text Duncan to 3598 to listen back on the podcast. Want to get in touch? Call 0800 863 293.